All right. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, so this session, in case there's any confusion, is uh, we're going to be talking about the MSW program as well as the uh, Master of Public Health, the MPH program. I have my I have my colleague in public health here, Michelle. Uh, I'll have her introduce herself in a moment, but my name is Oliver E.K. I do our admissions and recruitment for both our master's and our PhD program in social welfare. So the program today, uh, so we'll both spend about 10 minutes, give or take, talking about our respective programs, uh, the admissions requirements, because if you're going to apply for a joint degree at UCLA, you, you need to make sure that you're meeting requirements for both programs, and you want to make sure that you're submitting your application prior to respective deadlines. Uh, so public health, they may have an earlier deadline than us. So if you apply later, then it's going to be too late for the public health. And you, you know you can still be considered for our program, for example, but so you want to keep those things in mind. So uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Michelle, if you could uh, talk a little about yourself and introduce your program. Hey, thank you, Oliver, um, and welcome, everyone. Um, so I hope today's session is going to be um, it's going to be very informative for you and uh, engaging, and that we can have a conversation back and forth. Um, so as Oliver mentioned, I represent the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. I'm the director of admissions and financial aid. So I oversee our outreach, recruitment, um, and also uh, scholarship support for our incoming and continuing students. So I've been at FSPH, uh, I wouldn't say maybe like six and a half years. I've been at UCLA for I feel like a little over 11 years. Um, FSPH is very, very dynamic. Um, my background, I've worked in, in, well, I've worked in higher education really most of my professional uh, career um, throughout the country. Um, FSPH is definitely, I think, the most dynamic institution that I've been at. There's lots of things going on. Um, and our students are very engaged and very passionate, as I'm sure the MSW is as well, too. So that's just a little bit about myself. Um, and then I'll talk about our admissions process. And I actually have a couple of slides. I'm not sure if I have um, sharing privileges. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay. Great. Is every, can everyone see that? Okay. Okay, great. So this is our application process. So the application to FSPH is December 1. So as Oliver mentioned, our deadline may be earlier than, uh, than uh, the Luskin School. And it is important that you abide by this deadline because we will consider, this is when you'll receive the maximum consideration for both admission and uh, scholarships. Um, the department that we do the, the joint MPH to the uh, MSW is Community Health Sciences. So Community Health Sciences is a very popular department. I would say out of our, um, normally we admit each uh, fall, we admit about 100, or we have about a, between 120, 130 MPH students. And that includes our combined dual degree program. CHS is probably gonna be about half of that. So it's gonna be between 50 to 60 students. So they definitely get a lot of applications um, after, shortly after December 1, they'll stop receiving applications. So you don't want to be in that case scenario, you want to apply early. We have two application systems. So we have SOFIS, which is a common application for schools of public health. So SOFIS stands for Schools of Public Health Application System. That is our primary application system. That is where the review committee goes in and evaluates all of your components. And then we also have a supplementary application, our secondary application, the UCLA Graduate Division application. So we do that um, because it's we're required by Graduate Division, but that's not really our uh, primary uh, application system. So I'll talk a little bit further about each application system. Next. Okay. So this is a breakdown of the components that you need to submit for each uh, system. So as you can see, SOFIS is very, very comprehensive. It's everything. Uh, everything that you will submit for your application is going to be posted there. UCLA application is going to be a lot more succinct. 
Um, my recommendation for UCLA is only fill in the components that are, well, no, I should backtrack that. I'm talking about the dual degree program. So it's going to be a little bit different. Sorry, I just came out. I had another session for the general MPH this morning and uh, but it just ended about an hour ago. So I'm still kind of in that mode. So let me backtrack that. Let me talk about SOFIS. So SOFIS is absolutely everything that you are going to submit. Um, it is a pretty lengthy application. It's very, very comprehensive. You're not gonna be able to do it in one sitting. You need to do it like kind of separately, space yourself out, give yourself time to really devote uh, so that you can uh, best be able to answer everything there. At SOFIS, the way that it works is it's an outside providing agency. Once you submit your transcripts, letters of recommendation, all of that, it needs to be verified by SOFIS itself. So again, this organization is based in Boston. They do all the verifying for the transcripts. It normally takes, it can take up to two weeks for information to be verified. As long as you submit um, your application, like your end of the application uh, by December 1, it's considered on time. If your information is not verified until a couple of weeks after December 1, for us, that's okay. It's fine. We will still consider your application. Um, normally, for the UCLA application, these are the components that you would have had to fill out for us. But because you are doing a dual degree application um, and you know that's what Luskin uses, you'll actually need to submit everything as well there too. So I will actually say, so please scratch that. Um, I will actually say that a couple of things that you know you may be thinking as a dual degree student is you know should I submit the same statement of purpose of both schools? Should I submit the same personal statement? We I tend to tell uh, applicants do whatever feels comfortable to you. If you want to submit a statement specifically for the MPH program on SOFIS and something else on the UCLA system for Luskin, go ahead and do that. Right, we're not going to look at the UCLA components of it. Most people for ease, they are going to submit the same statement of purpose and the same personal statement and either the even the letters of recommendation. Most people are going to do that. But from our perspective, you, know, you can go either way uh, as you want. So there are um, both systems will have application uh, fees. Um, there are you can get waivers for uh, for either one of them if you do meet certain requirements. So SOFIS, the, uh, the fee waiver, that's administered by SOFIS itself. So you would have to contact them about a fee waiver. It can be income-based. It can be um, public service-based. So for instance, if you have served in a public service agency like uh, AmeriCorps, like Peace Corps, et cetera, you can qualify for an application fee waiver there too. Um, the UCLA application also has a fee waiver, the same thing. It can be need-based. Um, if you were in a undergraduate program, research program such as McNair, TRIO, um, Sally Casanova, Bill Gates um, Foundation, any of those, you can qualify for a fee waiver for the UCLA application. And you don't have to currently be in those programs. If you are a, an alumnus of that programs, you can qualify for that fee waiver. So um, I'll let like uh, I'll ever talk more about the UCLA component because that is their primary system. Um, but when you do fill out the UCLA application, you are gonna check off a box that indicates your interest in both of our programs. So that's how you know, we see that you do have an interest there. And these are the application components, as I mentioned before. So um, pretty standard application you know, components. Uh, the, the two things that I wanna you know, bring your attention to is uh, your uh, test scores. So we, for the MPH in Community Health Sciences, we are waiving the GRE requirement. Um, we have been waiving it since the pandemic. We've chosen to waive it again for this year. This is only for this upcoming cycle for 2023. Uh, we're evaluating the requirement on a year-to-year -year basis. So this is not going to be kind of like on an indefinite basis. So for the coming year, we are waiving the, um, the requirement. For your transcripts, we will need transcripts of all the schools that you've attended, including junior colleges. If you transfer from one institution to another, uh, we will need all of that on SOFIS. And um, we evaluate very holistically. So we are looking at all of the components of your application. UCLA does have a 3.0 minimum uh, GPA requirement. 
Um, so hopefully there's no issues there. But if there are, if your GPA falls a little bit short of that, you can still be admitted. Um, we would just need to petition on your behalf. So don't, you know, don't uh, despair or feel that you can't be admitted if you don't meet that requirement. Um, but aside from that, we have no real, real requirement. Um, and again, they, you know, the applications are reviewed very holistically. They are faculty members within the Department of Community Health Sciences that are evaluating your application. So I think that um, this is kind of uh, everything in a nutshell. So I'll turn it back to you, Oliver. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I love doing these sessions because I always learn something. So thank you for that. Um, I think our students, I know some of you may have questions more about like the program specifics, but I think in our student section, student alumni section, um, we'll really kind of dive more into the ins and outs of the, both programs. So for our purposes, we're just going to cover kind of admission requirements, just so you have a good feel of uh, the differences between um, the two. So I will share my screen now. Okay, um, so just kind of broad strokes here. Uh, I don't know where everyone here is in the process. If you know you want to apply to an MSW program, if you know you want to apply to public health program, or you're not quite sure, um, I wanted to just include this slide here um, just because this covers our areas of concentration. So if you are interested in any of these, you can kind of gain that expertise and that experience uh, in our MSW program. So we have three areas of concentration, uh, child and family well-being. So if you're interested in working with children and families, dealing with trauma, child welfare, and different policies affecting children and families, that area of concentration would be, uh, would be for you. Health and mental health across the lifespan, um, you know, people dealing with substance abuse, domestic violence, this is a great track for people who want to get into um, kind of uh, mental health services, like direct care and, and mental health and providing therapy. So a lot of people don't think of social work that way. They think, um, you know, psychology, clinical psychology, but uh, you can gain that expertise uh, as well through another step. Then our third track, which is probably the most common for uh, joint students with public health is our social and economic justice track. And this is gonna be more macro social work. So if you're interested in working in nonprofits, working on kind of issue, re issue related reform, whether it be poverty, immigration, criminal justice, uh, if you're looking to go into local government, uh, that that's really macro social work. Um, so that is something that uh, you can do as well with um, our, our program here. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because this is, this is going to get a little bit specific here. Um, so just very quickly, just talking about our curriculum. Um, so there's some research and stats kind of built into the program. It's a generalist, generalist practice. So the question we had earlier about kind of the difference between public policy, uh, we actually have some policy built into our first year core curriculum. So for people who are not maybe interested in getting into hardcore data analytics, this is enough for many people who don't really want to be a data analyst. So these are the things we kind of cover in uh, your first year in the per in the full uh, the two year program, and the second year is where you would kind of go into your area of concentration. So you would choose what you want to do. That's going to play into your second year, your kind of your um, your advanced practice classes as well as your field placement. So your field education will tie in kind of directly with uh, the area of concentration you choose. So if you go into health and mental health services, you'll most likely be at a mental health clinic or a hospital or something like that dealing um, you know, with, with, with these issues. Um, so that is that. Uh, and then so the admissions criteria, I'm just gonna throw all these up here. Um, so as Michelle mentioned earlier, so we strictly use the UCLA graduate division application. So uh, once you create your out your profile and everything on the UCLA grad website, from there you would just select the program. So if you select uh, MSW social welfare, there's going to be an option to select joint degree or a concurrent degree with public health. So once you do that, the system will automatically kind of tie you together with. The application for public health and and so that 
uh, we both, both of our programs know that you're applying to both programs. And then you don't, like Michelle mentioned, you don't necessarily need to double, double up on the requirements. So you're not gonna need six letters of recommendation. Um, you're not gonna need four essays. You can do that if you want, um, but it's not necessary. So usually, I personally think it's probably gonna be a stronger essay um, if it, you include both. So that way we, we see that you're dedicated to doing both. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Um, if you're an international student, TOEFL or IELTS scores, uh, we just need you to up to, you can just upload your transcripts and we actually look at all the courses you take, the grades you get. Uh, Michelle, just like public health, we actually have, you'll get reads from at least two faculty members. Uh, I would say both of our programs are quite unique in that some places you apply, your application will never reach faculty. And that's, it's kind of the sad reality in some cases, but you'll, for both of our programs, you're going to have faculty uh, making decisions on your application, which is great. Uh, three letters of recommendation. We ask for at least one academic, one professional. The third, up to you. Um, and when we say, and what we recommend is relationships. So if you had like a, I don't know, like a, a so so relationship with a social worker but you had a wonderful relationship with your manager at, I don't know, doing something completely outside of this field, I would go with that one. Um, I would, I, I think letters are gonna be stronger from people who know you better and are really gonna advocate for you. Um, Cause we have, and you know, be careful who you ask. We've, we've had some, some letters come in where, we've had letters come in where they say, I don't know why this person asked me to write a letter for them. And we're like, whoa, <laughs> what? So, um, so just uh, think about that when you're asking letter writers uh, who you have a relationship with. We always say, you know, if you've been at school for like five years, you're like, you know, I don't think I can get an academic letter. We always say, you know, your professors don't drop dead the minute you graduate, right? They're still roaming the halls, they're still there. Reach out if you have a relationship with them, they'll be happy to hear from you. They're gonna be happy that you're applying to grad school. So uh, for, for academic letters, we just ask that you, you know, give it your best effort. And then if not, uh, you know, we could, we can take three professional letters, but uh, we ask that you do your best to get this. All right, perfectly 1220, we did it, Michelle. Um, so that is my little presentation here for, for this. Um, okay, I think we have everyone. Yeah, I think we have everyone here. So uh, yeah, if you have, and we already see, I already see some questions in the chat regarding applications. So uh, maybe while uh, we are, our guests are speaking, Michelle and I can kind of try to go through these and answer in the chat. But uh, yeah, we want to respect our, the time of our students, our lovely students and one of our, and an alumnus. So I'm gonna, if we could just go around and introduce yourselves, maybe we could start with Nana. Hi everyone, um, my name is Nana. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the resident alumnus here. So I graduated from the dual degree program in 2021. Um, I was in community health sciences in fielding and child and family well-being and social welfare. Um, I had a halfway through COVID start. So for me, I did a year and a half in person and then quite literally the week of halfway through my program is when the pandemic began. So I definitely had a unique experience I'm happy to share about too. So nice to meet you all, welcome. Well, awesome, thank you, Nana. Uh, Brandy. Hi, can y'all hear me? Sorry, I'm outside in these headphones. Um, I, my name is Brandy and I am a second year um, in the dual degree program. Last year I did MPH. This year I'm just starting MSW and then next year I will do both. So yeah, nice to see you all. Thank, okay, great. Thank you, Brandy. Uh, we don't want Brandy to get a ticket either. So she's she's parked, her parking meter is gonna expire at exactly one o'clock. So she's gonna have to jump off. So if you have questions for her, ask feel free to put in the chat or try to get to her first. We don't want you to get a ticket, Brandy. We're gonna get you out of here before that. Okay, and uh, Andy. 
Hi everyone, my name is Andy. I use she, they pronouns. Um, I applied into both programs in 2021. Um, so I came in as a dual student and just like Brandy and my lovely cohort, I uh, did my MPH last year and this year and next year I'm doing MSW. Um, and yeah, I'm doing my MPH in community health sciences and my MSW in health and mental health across the lifespan. So happy to discuss that process of applying into both and the confusion of it all. Perfect, awesome, yeah. Um, so I, I, I think just kind of based on my memory that you all had different kind of paths into the joint degree. So thinking about, so these are prospective applicants now, thinking about where you were when you were deciding where to apply, were you planning on applying to both degrees from day one, or did that change, That did that evolve once you were in the program? So if you could talk about maybe your personal journey into grad school and what that was like, um, I think that would be really helpful for the people we have here. So why don't we start uh, with Nana again and go around. Yeah, what an interesting thing to reflect on. So I, um, the first thing to share is that I only took a year off between undergrad and grad school. And when I was finishing undergrad, I was kind of in that place, knowing, not really knowing what I wanted to do. I felt kind of just broad. I knew I wanted to go into the public sector. I'd studied public policy in undergrad, but I wasn't really sure what that looked like. Um, and I was very fortunate that I had a professor um, who mentored me that summer and I worked on a research project with her and she um, was high up in the Masters of Healthcare Administration program at my undergraduate university. So she would lead this really cool conference. Um, if any of you are still undergrads, I'll see if the conference is happening next summer. I'd be happy to share it with you. But it was called um, Diversity in Healthcare Leadership. And essentially it was a week long conference for students of color to be exposed to the field of public health and healthcare administration. And I had never really heard about public health at the time. You know, um, I think a lot of people knew about an undergrad, but it was a very small major at my school. And so she kind of cascaded me into the public health side of what I was interested in. And I had previously been interested in social work um, due to a few internships I'd had working in a juvenile detention center, doing some mentoring programs. I knew that was something that was very important to me. And so um, I happened to be talking to someone whose sister was a dual student. And that was the first time I heard the idea of doing two master's degrees at once. I didn't even know it was a thing. And so I kind of started what I'm sure a lot of you are doing, you know, roaming those forums of people who are asking questions about dual degrees or just about applying to grad school. And so I decided to apply um, a few months after I graduated. And I spent that year working as a case manager with the hospital based violence intervention program. So I was working with victims of violent crime, doing case management. And I think that experience really showed me the importance of both public health and social work, because oftentimes you get siloed into one or the other, but I think that they're so interwoven and so necessary. I kind of always describe it as public health taught me about the world, but social work and social welfare taught me how to move within it. And I think that they both were just so needed in the situation I was in and I felt very stuck often. And so that kind of furthered my decision to apply. Um, I, Wanted to stay in LA long-term, so I applied to USC and UCLA and then kind of decided between which two to go to. And um, I also had that brief wanting to do something new in my mid twenties. So I applied to Tulane as well. and was trying to decide like, do I move to New Orleans? Do I stay here? Which is where I wanna be long-term. But ultimately I actually just reached out to a lot of professors and messaged them. I called Dr. Abrams and just asked about like my interests. And I felt like there were more faculty interested in my long-term interests at UCLA. And I think it was the perfect fit for me. I had an amazing time during grad school. I'm like, feel so fondly about that experience. So I'm really grateful that it worked out that way. Okay, so I think I'm next. Um, my journey was a little bit more unconventional. Um, I actually took about six years off. Um, I have a young daughter. And so I took some time to just work and be a parent um, and, you know, figure all of that out before. And then 2020 hit and I was like, okay, what am I doing here? Like I did undergrad. Um, I did a post back program thinking that I wanted to be a doctor. And I realized, you know, medicine is all I knew because my mom is a doctor and she had me at 16. And so 
like I eat hospital food every night and it just, you know, it's my life. And so that's what I felt comfortable in. But I also was a world arts and cultures major at UCLA. And so I was like, how do I mix medicine that I know and arts education and like creative stuff? And then my role as a parent is super important. Um, and so I took a lot of time off. I worked as a fertility nurse for a while. And again, the pandemic hit and I kind of had like a self-reflection. It's now or never. If I, if I don't, do it now. I'm not going to do it at all. So um, I applied. Actually, I was looking at the dual program and I was, in all honesty, I was feeling a lot of um, imposter syndrome at that time. I hadn't been in school in a long time. I was like, I don't know. I only had professional letters of recommendation. I know someone, you know, asked that. And I was just kind of like, I don't know if I could do both. And I don't know if I could get into both. I don't know, like, what's going to happen. And so, um, I kind of rock, paper, scissors did. And I, you know, waited out and, you know, what do I, what am I thinking? And I applied to the MPH program, uh, which I absolutely love and loved my first year. And then um, someone told me, hey, you can petition in, you can, you can still apply to be a dual student. Um, and so after I did my first quarter and I got my feet wet and I was like, you know what, I can be here. I do deserve to be here. I can balance being like a full mom and, like a 30 year old student, you know, and I know it's not old, but like, I, I wasn't 21 or 22. And so, you know, it's just different. Um, and when I realized that I, you know, reached out to Oliver and reached out to the office and started the process of, you know, doing a new application uh, for or submitting for the dual degree um, and got in and I'm super grateful for it because I don't think I mentioned this before, but I'm also in community health, health sciences and the MPH, and then I'm doing um, child and family and the MSW. And so it really, for me, was this moment of like, my brain is all over the place. I don't know what I want to do, but I can do so many different things with, um, you know, within both of these departments and they really marry and they really intersect with one another in beautiful ways. I just got out of class and we were talking about public health and I was like, ah, um, and I'm like still doing my internship and then I'm starting a new, and, and it's all really like so beautifully woven together. Um, and so I'm grateful that I did it. But so if you all have any questions about that process, I didn't do it the conventional way, but um, if you're a little older, come, you know, trying to come back in, or if you have questions about navigating, you know, both degrees, I'm here. Um, I think it's great that I'm following Brandy because I had the complete opposite experience. I am like the most conventional student I think ever. Um, so I graduated with my bachelor's in 2021 in cognitive neuroscience. And I was um, definitely like a pre-med student who knew I wanted to go to grad school before considering med school or PA school. Um, so I wanted to apply straight in. I knew if I took a gap year, I wasn't gonna go back. <laughs> so I applied straight in, which was very overwhelming, um, finishing up my degree during COVID as well as doing research and applying to graduate schools. Um, so I was in all of your positions. I went to all the information sessions, how I met Oliver and Nana. Um, so, yeah, my sort of mentality was I just did as much research as I could. I knew I was, I loved medicine um, and I knew I definitely wanted to help people and do more of like the social work therapy route. Um, and it was just Googling that I sort of saw all these dual degrees and I didn't know what a lot of the words meant. I was like, cool, dual degree in public health and public policy. I didn't really know what it meant. So it was just a lot of research and messaging random people on LinkedIn um, and messaging random professors and being like, do you have 30 minutes just to talk to me about my interest and if the dual program is right for me? Um, and so I sort of just, I applied straight into the dual degree. So I applied to both programs and my mindset was like, it'll better my chances of getting into the school. <laughs> like <laughs> applying it to two programs is better than one program. I'm interesting in, I'm interested in both. I can always, you know, do what Brandy did and like add on if I wanted to, um, Sort of just like it is what it is. I'm already doing a ton of applications. So what's one more? That was sort of the, my mindset um, with it. And I always wanted to go to UCLA. I did apply to some other dual programs um, like Penn and Washington and Columbia. But I sort of knew, even though I said yes last minute, like I always knew I was going to go to UCLA. Um, and I honestly, I tell everyone this, but I 100% manifested this. Like, I don't care what anyone says. I was like manifesting for like six months straight that I was getting into the dual program at UCLA. 
Um, but yeah, just a lot of research and similar to what everyone else said, um, they're really broad degrees with very specific concentrations. So you can do a lot with the degrees, but still be able to take classes that are more focused towards your interests, which I really appreciated and how interwoven they both are um, in terms of coursework, um, which I also really appreciated. All of the dual students sort of help each other out from year to year. So it can be a little confusing, but we all try to figure it out together and support one another. Um, I do realize this is my, what, third day of social work classes. And I like the social work degree better than the public health degree personally. Um, but then again, last year was sort of during COVID. So it was hybrid and virtual and in-person and everything was very last minute. Um, so yeah, that's sort of my route. I don't exactly know what I wanna do. I'm really interested in like medical social work or therapy or being a child life specialist or PA school still. Um, but yeah, I'm like, I'm 23, I'm going with the flow, figuring it out. Um, so if anyone's doing like the super conventional way and is, is overwhelmed or have any questions, um, feel free to ask. Hey, thank you. Thank you all for um, that um, really great uh, information into your background. And um, so I'll ask the next question. So this is in terms of your student experience while you were at UCLA or at, are at UCLA. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the um, types of like what you've done kind of outside the classroom? Um, and UCLA has so much to offer. So what you've done at your respective schools, like at either at Luskin or at FSPH, if there's any campus-wide initiatives that you've participated in, and then also balancing everything out, just because there is, you know, so much to do and you have your personal lives, you have all of that going on, it can get overwhelming. So um, what do you do to balance all everything that you want to do? Um, so you could start with Nana again. Another really good question. Um, I think something that I would like to share that's important is that I went to school in LA. I went to USC for undergrad. So when I went to grad school, all I had a group of friends. Like I lived with my college roommates still, you know, I was very supported socially. And so I do think that when I started school, I was excited to make new friends, but I also kind of felt like Monday through Friday, I was a student. And then you know, on the weekends, I'd still go to football games. Like I would do my own thing with friends. And I think that shifted a lot when COVID happened for me because I couldn't see anyone. So my classmates became much closer in my life. And I think that was a very notable change in my grad school experience. Uh, but I was kind of all over the place. I know when I first started my first quarter, my parents were very helpful supporting me so I could kind of get my toes wet because I was really struggling as well with imposter syndrome. And, you know, like I barely passed my college GE bio class, which shouldn't be hard, but it was a struggle. So I was really nervous about public health because I didn't really understand how sciencey or not it would be. And that's not my strong suit. And so I took off the first quarter and then after that kind of jumped into the deep end very quickly. Um, and so I feel lucky that I was involved in quite a few different things. On the public health side, I was a public health um, advocacy fellow, which means that you do a longer internship. And I worked at the LA County Department of Public Health with the Office of Violence Prevention, which is actually where I work now. So I can talk more about that later on. Um, I also was a part of Green Ribbon Club, which I'm not sure if it still exists, but it's kind of like a student run mental health support group um, that a lot of my cohort was very involved in. And I also had a graduate student research position which I took at the Center for Healthier Children, Families, and Communities, which is um, in affiliation with both Fielding and the Geffen School of Medicine. And so um, that was kind of my public health side. And then on the social work side, I was involved with Luskin Black Caucus. I was on board for both years. And um, during my experience there, um, we experienced the murder of George Floyd and kind of that civil unrest of um, the summer of 2020, which was not new, but just heightened in a lot of ways and it happened during finals week. And so I was pretty um, deeply involved in the action plan that um, Luskin has to address racism and anti-Blackness on campus. And then apart from that, I also, um, you know, like you have your capstone, you have other things going on, you have your internship. And so um, those were kind of keeping me busy as well too. 
Um, I don't remember what the question was, Michelle, if I addressed that, but I think for me, the balancing challenge was, I'll speak to the first half of my program because I think starting in March, 2020, everything just looked so different when it came to balancing. And it was definitely not great that you can just join a meeting at any time. Cause I think it was really hard to set boundaries because of that. But before I think almost having that separate life did help because I knew on the weekends, like I was going to go to the Coliseum to go to a football game. I was going to spend time with my friends separately. And when I came home from campus, like my friends forgot that I wasn't going to a job during the day. I was going to class versus they were going to a job. So it took them a while to remember like, oh, what did you learn today in school? Like it was just very different. And I think that was helpful for me to have that separation. And so I very much used campus as the place to study. I would go to the library a lot. I had never been a library person in undergrad, but I got to have a physical separation that I think was really needed for me as someone who struggles to have boundaries. And so um, there's probably a lot more that I could say, but I'll leave room for Brandy and Andy to also add into the conversation. Yeah, I'll speak to that first part about ways to get involved. Um, there's so much. When you get in, you will get at first, it maybe it feels a little overwhelming because you'll get millions and millions of emails. That's what it feels like. Um, but then when you start to like realize, okay, who's sending the emails? And some of these are, you know, duplicates about the same thing. And this, let me read more into this and let me look more into what this opportunity is. Um, and I'll be honest, when I first started last year, there were so many things. And I was like, I just want to do all of it. <laughs> this is great. I want to do all of it. Kind of like what I did in undergrad where I just was in way too many things. Um, I ended up joining the maternal child health um, program, which is like a separate little, you know, niche program within public health. Um, and so I would join their interest group and I would also join the reproductive health um, interest group, you know, meetings and things like that. And it kind of aligned with what my, you know, my focuses were. Um, and I had a, because you do get faculty advisors in both programs. And so I spoke with my faculty advisor and I was like, you know what, I want to do all of these things and I want to, you know, be able to build my resume and I want to say that, I, and I want to really have the experience, um, but I just don't have the capacity to do it all. Um, and what she told me was, you have done so much in your life when you got into this point you already have that part figured out now just do things that you're passionate about like you don't need to just do things frivolously just to build a resume right or just to like look good for another entity she said start you know start doing some research you can do it with me we'll get you a publication you know things like that where it was meaningful um, and the work was meaningful and it didn't feel like it was just extra time or extra things um, I haven't really dug it's only our third day of class for social uh, welfare and so I haven't really you know gotten into a lot there but another thing was we do you know in between you can do it anytime but a lot of students will do in between their first and second year for MPH is their um, their hours for their internship and so you know I got really lucky where I love 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 my internship I'm still I've kind of dragged it out in all honesty cover your ears <laughs> dragged it out a little bit because I really love it and they have now offered me to kind of stay on because we've gotten so you know ingrained in the project and all of that but simultaneously in social welfare you before school even starts like you know it was a shocker but before you even start classes we've already been in the field and so I'm um, you know working with a coalition that works with justice impacted youth and so finding the connections and referring people to the resources that in my internship and things like that even though it's a lot of hours every week, um, mostly unpaid hours, right? But a lot of hours during the week of public service type work, um, it's it's meaningful because they intersect and because they align with my values and they align with what I wanna do. Um, and then speaking to the balance part, I don't know that I figured that all out yet, right? Um, it's a lot and I sometimes, I am able to, I've gotten into a groove of balancing school but balancing then turning that off and being full-time mom at home is, is tricky. Um, my daughter knows a lot about public health stuff. <laughs> she knows a lot about everything, which is great. I mean, I love, you know, maternal child health. I love reproductive health and she's 11. And so I'm like, great, let's talk about, you know, sex, <laughs> things like that. And so it is kind of, I mean, she, we were doing a lot of Zoom school last, last 
court last year. And so, you know, she would kind of listen in and be like, oh, what's this? And so, you know, I'm trying to balance in a way of like bringing, you know, her in a part of it and having her feel like she knows what I'm doing and where I am during the day and, um, you know, also balancing that. But I think find I think in undergrad, your shift really is to add all of these things so that when you apply, you are the strongest applicant, right? We can all agree to that. But when you get into grad school, really, it's about what's going to what's going to add to me and what can I add to in a meaningful way that's going to propel me into something in the future. And it's not necessarily just about like a million accolades. And I think if you realize that, it'll help you to not over promise and under deliver or over get overly involved in everything because we just I mean, so one thing that we learn in our classes in public health and in social work is you can't do it all. Right. So really hone in on what it is that you what your focus is and and try and yeah go from there lord i feel like i need to take brandy's advice um i will start by saying last year i commuted so i commuted from about an hour and a half away um and this year i have the privilege of living here so my experiences in terms of what i can do extracurricularly definitely flipped um especially because last year was sort of virtual and hybrid. Um, so um, there are these certificates that you can do um, that everyone else has mentioned that just uh, require some um, additional classes, et cetera. Um, I went to all of the interest meetings so I didn't really know what I was interested in because um, my thing is like, just try it once, join the Zoom call. If you don't like it, it's just 30 minutes of your time. So I joined the maternal and child health certificate just like Brandy and this year I'm the executive of the board um, for the interest group. Um, so that's a big focus of mine. Um, and last year, as well as this year, I'm a teaching assistant. So last year I sort of did it um, 10 hours a week and this year I'm doing it 20 hours a week, um, which I love. I love my class. Um, when you're a TA, you get the lovely benefit of getting free tuition mostly. Um, so with that, I don't have to worry as much um, to have another job to pay to be here, which is really, really nice. Um, okay, 20 hours, but it's like not 20 hours. Like it's it's 20 hours. Um, for Oliver and Michelle, it's 20 hours, but for everyone else, it's not 20 hours. Um, and so I got really fortunate um, with my class. It's not a lot of work. Different TA positions hold different weight, um, which I love. Um, in addition, I am like, what do I do? I do a lot. My schedule is so packed. And I don't even know what I do. I'm a resident assistant in the dorms. I did that in undergrad. Um, it's an easy way to sort of get free housing and free food, but there's a lot of social work and being an RA. I feel like mainly I'm using a lot of my social work skills to be an RA. Um, so there's that as well, which takes up a lot of my time. Um, and people always say my schedule is crazy and I will say that it is. So balance is definitely really challenging. Um, I focus a lot on friends this year, especially because when you, since it's a three-year program, right? Sorry, there's a truck going by. Cool, so it's a three-year program, right? So I started in the MPH um, with that incoming cohort and now I switched the MSW cohort. So the cohort I entered with is gonna graduate before me, if that makes sense. So I'm focusing this year a lot on the friendships that I'm making within the MSW program because I'm going to be with them for two years. And that's really how I balance a lot of things. Um, doing everything with friends makes it easier. So doing paperwork for internship, doing classes at a coffee shop, being surrounded by friends doesn't make it seem as stressful and intense. Um, but I went straight in from undergrad. So I was already in that mindset of doing all these things, doing all these work, making sure I passed my classes. Um, so, and I think that comes with knowing myself, right? Like I know what I'm capable of and I know what my schedule can look like for me to be successful. And it takes some practice and saying yes and saying no to figure out what that is for you. But I definitely encourage you all to like, maybe the first quarter, like sit back and figure out like, can I do one more thing? Can I add something on? Uh, so I'm very grateful that within therapy, I know myself very well to know sort of what I'm capable of. Um, and, yeah. And my, I mean, I also like random, I don't know, the UCLA opportunities you get are so random. Like I was in a violence prevention class, told the professor I was interested in it. And the next thing I know, I'm getting a free trip to Maine to do like a research project. Like the randomest things sort of just like 
come up and cheer laugh that you get these amazing opportunities as, as grad students so I always say like like Brandy said like read all of your emails and attend everything that you can because you never sort of know what can lead to what right like I was a UC Lens intern this summer and that's what I wrote about in my statement of purpose for UCLA so you just sort of never know what opportunities there are unless you branch out and experience those things um but yeah just sort of know yourself and what you're capable of and give yourself grace know that you can say no um, but also know you can say yes to certain things so I think that would be like my biggest piece of advice um yeah I hope that answered the question oh man that was great you are three of you amazing I'm so impressed. Um, okay, so let's open up for questions. We have about 13, 12 minutes. Don't forget, Brandy needs to leave soon. So if you want to, start, if you want to start with her, don't be shy. We're all friends here. We're all family. So uh, please, this is a great opportunity. Three very different people with very different backgrounds um, to provide this really helpful information. So, any questions? Oliver, if it's okay, well, um, I just kind of want to back up Andy's point about the social aspect of being in a three-year program, because I do think that is a pretty tough transition. Um, and for me, I guess, because I finished it, like, I was significantly closer with my public health cohort than I was with my social work cohort, I think partially because that's who I entered with. Um, and so that meant for the last year of school, like, all my good friends, all my group texts were people who were at work and done at five and I was at school and done. I'm not even gonna say what time of the day I was done, you know? And it was really difficult because I hadn't really prepared myself for that transition. It did help that because it was during COVID, everyone was kind of in the same setting where they weren't able to leave, but I did often feel very lonely. And I think it made that third year a challenge. And so I really do think that social aspect of finding your people in both cohorts is absolutely necessary. Um, and I wish I had realized that earlier. But also I had a really great public health cohort and they're the best people in the world. My social co work cohort is amazing too, but I do feel like there's just something really special about my entering class in public health. Right. Any questions? Um, there was a question about housing. Um, so we heard, we heard about Andy's experience with her commute and then finding uh, a living um, situation in year two. Uh, how about Nana and Brandy? Did you uh, did you have what was your experience with housing? Yeah. So um, like I told y'all, I did undergrad at UCLA too, and I actually had my daughter my third year. Um, and so I already kind of knew, and funny story, my mom had me at 16, but I also lived UCLA family housing with her as well. And I was a little baby. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of different options. Um, there's a couple different options, like living locally, living at home and commuting. I know there's graduate housing as well, but if you are, I believe a parent and um, are married or in a domestic partnership, there is family um, student housing. And so that's pretty incredible. So it's my second time living there. I lived on the other side years ago and I live on the, and it, it's great because everybody is a student. So you get it, everyone's like walking with their backpacks or everyone, you know, there's like the group chats and all of that. Um, there's a bunch of community wide stuff that they do. If that, if any of y'all fall, you may not, but if any of y'all fall in that category, it's actually been um, incredible just to like have a family type community. Um, that's still UCLA owned. Um, so I lived in West Hollywood while I was in grad school. Um, one of my roommates worked in Studio City, the other worked in Playa del Rey, and I was going to school in Westwood. So we picked the middle area between the three. Um, I loved living in West Hollywood. I think the area specifically, I got really lucky with rent prices. It's definitely not a cheap area, but I really liked that I lived somewhere I could walk. And so um, for example, when I was doing my clinical internship, I would walk as I was talking to my kiddos when COVID first started and like we didn't have telehealth. And I felt very, it felt nice to be able to walk outside with trees like during my day. And I think that was very, very necessary for me going through clinical internships in which, you know, um, something that I, I guess this would be an important question for you as you join the program, but for me, especially because all of my clinical internships were during COVID, that meant that I was talking to kids about these really dark and traumatic experiences 
four feet away from my bed and where I spent all of my time. And so it felt really nice to have a place that I could feel comfortable being outside often. And I also really liked that I could leave campus and pretend like I was a student. I could do my own thing, hang out with my friends. And I think that was really needed for me. Um, I will say also a lot of people who do live off campus tend to live in Palms or Culver. There's a lot of bus lines or bike routes that lead to the two schools over there. So I do think that's probably the most common area people live or tend to look. Um, I had friends that lived with other random students like engineering students. I had friends that were renting a room from older folks who had their kids had grown out of the house. There's a ton of different options. And I think as much as possible, connecting with people the year above you in the cohort can definitely point out where there's some open rooms or where to look um, Facebook wise and things like that. Awesome. All right. So uh, Oliver, Lily, Samantha, I, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say I have to hop off to it so I don't get a ticket. But if any of y'all have any questions for me about anything, please just send them to Michelle and Oliver and I promise I'll respond or can give them my email, whatever. Um, and I will, yeah, it's nice to see you all. Thank you, Brandy. Have a good day. See ya. All right, Lily, Samantha, to Samantha, I see your faces. I'm gonna call you out, any questions? I do have a question. Um, I'm curious if anyone has any knowledge or can speak to um, how the programs support people that may be interested in doing more um, international work or have a globalized perspective um, to both public health and um, social work, social welfare. Michelle, do you wanna address that? Or if not, I can talk about some of my classmates' experiences after. Um, you, uh, I could, we could do either, but I think from your perspective might, move, might be more valuable as a student. Yeah, I, I would say there's a global health certificate in fielding. I know that for sure. There's also, a certificate in Luskin, not specifically the social welfare department that I can't remember what the acronym is. Um, so those are obviously two options there, but there were quite a few students who had the option to do their internship internationally. Um, I had quite a few friends. It was like their texts were suddenly green all summer. You know, you just don't hear from them because they're off doing um, what they wanted to. And so one thing that is different about the public health versus social work program is that for public health, you can choose your internship for the summer and for social welfare, your first year it's assigned to you and then you um, apply to a list of internship options. So you, there's a lot more freedom there, but it's still from a list. And so I think people tended to use their public health internship to kind of do the wider range or more out there internship that they had the option for. Like for myself, I very intentionally picked my public health internship. And so people picked to go, a lot of people are in Latin America. And one of my professors, Dr. Kuhn does a lot of work in Thailand, I believe. I can't remember for sure where it is, but there's that option too. So I would say either try and do it through an internship or when you're at UCLA, you'll kind of find out which professors have done work where. Um, and you can kind of connect with those professors, ask about research opportunities. But I will say too, I, and this is kind of just like a personal belief that I hope is okay to say too, but I think with some of the professors that do do international work, it's important to talk with them about what that work is and how they approach it in a culturally sensitive way. Because I think as much as we love our professors, they're not perfect. And some of them who do do international work I think it could be approached in a different way. So I'm not gonna say more than that, but I think it's really important that if you are doing any work with any professor, you know, like you can read their bio online, but having those intentional conversations one-on-one -on -one makes such a difference. And I've been very surprised by professors I didn't think I would connect with or have that kind of relationship with versus professors, you know, I thought that this would be exactly what I wanna do, but further reading about their project or what they're doing, I didn't feel like it aligned with who I am. So yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Um, I have a quick question about internships as well. So basically, like, do you give us options of what to do, or do we have to do all the research on what we want to do internship-wise ourselves? I will say that for the public health internship, um, they do have, um, we have, like, a faculty um, liaison um, 
and a faculty education advisor. So they'll host sort of a, a meeting and go over sort of how the public health internship works um, because there are credits that the internship is sort of based on a class, it's called CHS 400. And through that class, you have to do like certain reflection logs and meet certain assignments to get four units towards your degree. Um, but the internship in of itself, it's sort of up to you. So there's certain guidelines, um, there's certain what we call competencies that have to follow. You have to have a internship supervisor or preceptor who meets certain requirements that are set by the fielding school. Um, so as long as you meet all those requirements, you can sort of do your internship wherever you want that's like reasonable, right? So like I had friends who like went to Africa. I did my internship virtually because that's what worked best with like my schedule and what I wanted to do in my interests. Um, so you get to do your own research and talk to professors um, and figure it out. I mean, there's people who can help you if you really have no idea, right? Um, you have to have, I think, one meeting with Sarah Blenner, who is sort of in charge of all the internships, and she'll look through your resume and your interests and post a bunch of internships if you're interested in them. So you can either go off that list of what past students have done or different organizations who are emailing the fielding school and are like, we want interns, send them our way kind of a thing. Um, or you can go out on your own and sort of Google an internship close to your home or anything like that. Um, I hope that answers your question. And for like the social work, it's like Nana said, the first year it's given to you, like I had to fill out an application online and I got sent a random email that was like, hey, like this is, you're gonna interview with this place, email this person and schedule it. You like can't really say no. So you sort of just like schedule the interview and either you get it and that's your internship for the year or you don't get it and they'll send you another email um, for like another internship where I think Nana can speak more towards like second year MSW, um, but like she said, there's a list and you sort of get to like pick your internship based off of that. Yeah, really quickly for the second year internship, there's a long list, so it is a wide range of options. And I picked something that I felt would lead to my career choice. I think one thing we didn't talk about that I'm sure a lot of you are wondering is how do you decide which field to go into afterwards? And so I'd be happy to talk about that with anyone after, or if I don't know how long we can stay on, I'm free if people do have questions about that. But I picked an internship that met with my long-term goals. So I picked something that was specific to adolescent trauma. It was in South LA. It was an organization I knew of and highly respected. And it also had very heavy clinical training, which I did not get during my first year internship. So I picked that intentionally and I'm so, so grateful I did, even though I was like stressed for the first like three months of it. Um, so I do think that the second year kind of, depending on which program you end in, that internship could make a difference long-term for you. Okay, we're right at time. Um, we wanna respect everyone's time. I know that Michelle needs to jump off as well. So. Uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch with anyone, one of, any of our participants, you can feel free to uh, email myself or Michelle, um, and we can definitely put you in touch with them. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you, Nana and Andy, so much. Thank you, Brandy. Hopefully, you didn't get a ticket. Uh, Andy left her email as well. So if you want, uh, so did Nana. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so if anyone wants to take those down. Um, it's always great. I mean, they could just provide information that, you know, that we can't, it's going to mean more coming from their mouth. So, but thank you, Michelle. Again, thank you, Nana and Andy. Thank you everyone for being here and, uh, <laughs> have a great day. Everyone, anything else, else to add, Michelle? I uh, know that's it. Um, just feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Um, we're here, we're here to guide you all of, all, you know, everyone. Um, and yeah, we'll, we will hopefully get your applications, but, um, that's it. Have, have a great day, everyone. Perfect. All right. Okay. Thanks again, everyone. Take care. Bye. See you soon.